Hello, Twitch. How are we doing today? My oh, name is James oh, Spencer. Oh, oh. I am as partner students architect here at AWS and one of the hosts on Howdy Partner. And it is 2024. It is a new year. We got a whole brand new slate of partners that we want to get you, you to know and show off awesome stuff that they're doing here on Howdy Partner. I'm joined with me by my host, my co-host. Hopefully I'm pointing the right yes, I pointed the right way. Simon Panic. How are you doing today, Simon? Great. How are you doing, James? I'm also a Partner Solutions Architect and excited to meet our guests today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of our guest, Zamelgo, they are primarily kind of an IoT uh, partner of ours. They have a lot of other offerings. I think that's kind of what we focus on today. Uh, they will correct me if I'm wrong, obviously. Uh, Simon, you know a little bit about IoT. I, I always get this question when people are like, what, do I, what is IoT? And they're, I'm like, it's an internet of things. And they're like, what does that mean? And then I go, well, it's things that are connected to the internet. And then they're like, that doesn't help. Can you help maybe as someone who knows better? I mean, in a very basic sense, you're exactly right. It's these devices, let's take an example, like a light switch that you can now control with your phone. Now, there's obviously a lot happening between that light switch and your phone that's going to make it possible. And that's where AWS IoT can step in. It's going to allow for that communication between it. It's going to allow us to collect the data and the states of these light switches and can control them. But also, we're going to see some cooler things today that we can use on an industrial scale at a much like larger, really impactful meaning or meaningful use. And excited to hear about that as well. Yeah, and uh, being an AWS channel and employees, uh, it's cool. They built a lot of their stuff using I uh, AWS services. For example, some of the things they had talked about: uh, AWS TimeStream, AWS Neptune, Dynamo, S3. SES, SNS, I can keep going, API Gateway, AppSync. Uh, but I thought the, the cool thing is they use three different kind of things as their core. They use AWS Neptune, AWS Dynamo, and S3. Those are all kind of data solutions, Simon. I, I'm not a data expert. What's, what's kind of the difference between S3, Dynamo, and Neptune? Like, let's, maybe break it down. Let's start with S3. That's the big one. Um, it's object storage, which can allow us to store all different kinds of data. And it's been built to be very scalable, highly cost effective, and globally accessible. So this is going to be the basis for a lot of large scale storage. It's also going to back a number of other AWS services that allow you to store data. So S3 is the big one. Um, it's typically one of the first places that customers and partners are going to store data, but it also gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, if we look at Dynamo, that is a non-relational database. And one of the benefits here is that it can act in a very quick ma manner. Um, you can achieve single digit microsecond latencies. So if you're doing things like financial transactions, this would be a good uh, potential use case. And then we look at the AWS Neptune, which or Amazon Neptune, which is a graph database. So this might be used something for more like highly interconnected, very large data sets. Uh, but really interested to hear today how they're using Neptune and maybe give us some examples. Awesome. Yeah, that, that helped me a little bit. At least I got a little bit of separation between the three. Data solutions, but doing different things in different ways. And if anyone else has any better definitions, help us out in the chat. And if you're in the chat, welcome. And tell us where you're from. It's like I said myself, it's a crisp, warm 41 degrees here in Seattle. Simon is near Seattle. Uh, what was it? Bellingham, I think? Bellingham, yeah, a couple hours north and yeah, maybe a few degrees cooler. Expecting some yeah. snow this weekend. It's going to drop off. Yeah. So yeah, let us know in the chat where you're from. And speaking of that, like I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing us talk. Uh, maybe we're ready to bring on Zamelgo and they can tell us better. I mean, they're the experts. They're the one who built the stuff, obviously. So if they're ready to come on, let's go ahead and bring them in. All right. Ruben and Akila, how are you doing today, guys? Doing, doing great. Howdy, partners. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Ruben. Us. Yeah. Uh, Ruben, your room looks a little funny. Uh, where, what are you doing? Well, first of all, I guess you could introduce yourself, and then you can tell us why why your uh, room looks a little interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. The lighting is a little off. but uh, So my name is Ruben Press. I'm the chief commercial officer at Zamelgo. Basically, I'm a salesperson. Uh, I've been doing this for about 30 years, uh, delivering technology-based solutions from a software side as well as the hardware side. Um, but more, more importantly, on the RFID side, which we'll spend a lot of time on today, for the last 20 years, uh, I've been involved in delivering RFID solutions that impact businesses uh, in a positive way. So I'm really excited today to be part of this and talk to everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm based out of, uh, I live in the Philadelphia area, 
I was born in New York, but this hotel's in Chicago. So I'm all over the right place. Akila keeps me flying every day she can. And uh, I love it, though, because I love delivering solutions that really impact business. So, again, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Great. Yeah, welcome to the show. Akila, how are you doing? Where are you at? I am right next door. I'm in Seattle. <laughs> You're over here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a Seattle native. Uh, actually, I, I born and brought up in India, uh, moved to the U.S. for my master's. Actually, in India, I lived in this small manufacturing town. My dad used to work for a big uh, power electrical turbines locomotives manufacturing company in India. Um, and yeah, and then I moved to the US and my life's gone a full circle. Now I build software solutions for manufacturers and logistics companies. So, Awesome. Great. Yeah. Well, we're happy then, to have you on here. Yeah. And then my role at Zamalgo, I'm one of the co-founders and I'm the chief technology officer. So I, I build the, the product that Ruben gets to sell. So any questions technically go that way? <laughs> If you want to buy it, go this way. This way, this way. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So yeah, in chat, if you have any questions, perfect. Either way, if you want to know how stuff works or how to, you know, what's going on, we're gonna look there. If we want to know how to buy it and get some, you know, get some traction going, maybe we'll look here. Awesome. And if you have any questions, any comments, anything, please drop them in the chat. Uh, and as I've said a hundred times. I'm sure people are tired of hearing me talk. I talk too much. I could go on for hours. So uh, I think we got a little presentation first to go over as far as Zamalgo. Uh, Ruben, do you want to start with you? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Let's pull this up here. All right, cool. Excellent. So I'm going to start with this, just a few slides here. Um, and it's important that uh, I don't spend a lot of time doing this because we want to spend time within the software and Aquila's going to show you the application uh, specifically and how it can really impact business and how easy it is to use. Um, but as a high level uh, on Zamelgo and who we are and, and why we're here today, um, we're, as Akhil said, we're a Seattle-based organization. Uh, we develop software, SaaS-based solutions, um, leveraging the power of AWS. And our, our focus as an organization is really to try to impact you know, traditional businesses of today, which really have a hard time trying to embrace and, and deploy uh, technology based solutions. So what they need is a, an easy way to enter into the space, leveraging the technology and then taking advantage of the of the benefits of it. So it really comes down to, you know, transforming, transforming those traditional operations, leveraging sensor based technology, in this case, predominantly RFID. Um, but we can take in really any type of sensor taking that data and providing that data real time to businesses to uh, enable them to act and be more decisive and allow for more quicker real time decision making processes. So that's really where we focus. And we do that through providing certain applications and we call these our smart suites. And these suites can run individually or they can run together. And the reason why we did that and we built this to be modular is to allow for an easy starting point. If somebody wants to start with just inventory management, they can, um, or they want to go into asset tracking, they can add that, but they can start one or the other. So our applications include asset tracking, work order management, inventory management, as well as shipment tracking. And what's interesting about these applications is that, you know, we started in the manufacturing space and we really cut our teeth there. And the impact there has been tremendous. You know, all these applications apply to manufacturing. But what we found is that we've had logistical environments, warehousing distribution, which also, you know, applies to other areas as well. But inside there, where it has a great impact to use inventory management as well as shipment tracking. And then in retail and in healthcare, um, the, these applications apply and, and they're very um, advantageous for organizations to, to leverage that. And again, leveraging the sensor-based technology providing the data that we're capturing in a real-time way and allowing for more informed uh, business decisions. Our, as I mentioned, our solutions are, are modular, but also our solution can be self-contained. It can run on its own or it can run in the background and feed uh, a, a front-end system that's already in use. In use. We're, we're not about uh, trying to replace anything. We're trying to embrace and extend the reach of those systems by implementing our solution at Zamelgo. 
And we do that um, through integration and back end integration or front end integration, depending on what we're doing and, and what the client needs. But it's about extending that capability uh, and enhancing what they already have today with the features that we bring to the table. Another that, thing is, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Ruben, that inventory management one, I, I'm hoping we can poke into that later. But I used to work when I was younger, I used to work for a company that has a big mouse, uh, maybe. You've heard of him before. And I worked in a warehouse and I kid you not, every night I was an inventory controller. Every night I would go through and count churros one by one. Like one pallet, you know, has X number of boxes, has next number of churros. And then I had to go through the the boxes, the open ones, count individually how many churros were left. Yeah. So uh no, yeah, that would be a perfect situation for that, it sounds like. Well, I mean, it, it absolutely is. And if you th think about it, you know, today, you know, people are manually counting with their hands, but also we progressed to barcoding, right? And then now we're at RFID and, you know, we can read a thousand uh, items in, in a minute. Um, so you can't scan. It's scanning and barcodes is one to one. We're RFID. I can read an entire room. So, you know, the biggest challenge we've seen is, is the adoption of the technology out of fear because traditional businesses aren't used to or comfortable. Mm. So when we designed our system from the ground up, we did it in a way to allow for companies to easily get engaged and deploy one or two readers, see the benefits of the solution, and then expand from there. And that was really important for us when we built this to allow for that easy adoption, get them comfortable, kind of a crawl, walk, run approach, and then take it from there. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking forward to it. The other, uh, I think, important part of and really differentiates us is the ability to customize the solution. You know, what we don't want to do is have companies uh, running their business the way our software operates. We want our software to support the way their business runs. And that's really important to us. So we call that co-creation. And we work very closely with our clients. And as you can see here, you know, from spacesuits to rocket ships to building boats to trucks, um, you know, our applications really cross a lot of different spectrums and, and including retail, you know, tracking denim. If you're thinking about inventory again and, and reading a, a, denim, a denim wall product with your, with your hands would be, you know, it would take you days where with a reader, you can do it in minutes. So, um, but we do this co-creation to allow for the flexibility for our application to apply to certain business environments. And it works really well. And a lot of organizations out there or software solutions out there don't have that flexibility the solution operates a certain way with us. The way we built this again was with this in mind and the experience that we've had in the past of what's needed by businesses. And that's what we deployed here today. And then lastly, to kind of circle back, because I don't, again, I want to spend the time with the actual seeing the actual software and demonstrating it. But I, I think these are important points to mention, you know, real time visibility, you know, across all operations. It's not about collecting data and taking a look at it the next morning. It's about collecting data and in real time being able to react to it. Uh, understand if there's a bottleneck, if there's a challenge going on that you can address right then and there. And our, our alerts and our, our system allows for that immediate and real time decision making, which has a tremendous impact on businesses. And providing that, you know, that automated approach of collecting that data as well as providing accurate, you know, hand counts or barcode counts, you miss things. With RFID, because you can do things so quickly, you can do it multiple times. And most people don't realize that when you think about RFID, well, it can't be perfect. Well, it's not perfect. Nothing is perfect. But because it's so fast, it allows you to do it multiple times, which on average will bring you to a, a, a solid number you're comfortable with from an inventory standpoint. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that, you know, return on investment is really important to us from, you know, we have to be bringing value. You know, our, our solutions are application specific. We're not a middleware. We're just sitting out there collecting data and it's there for you to look at when you want to. We're addressing specific challenges within the businesses and making sure that we're allowing for companies to op be more optimized, more efficient, more productive. And we're delivering that ROI. And it couldn't be something that happens within two months or six months, but we want it also to be long term. We want it to be sustainable. And so we make sure upfront that we understand the business challenges our clients are having. And then we address those challenges directly with our applica application specific solutions. So that's my, my quick run through uh, from a PowerPoint deck standpoint. This is probably the shortest PowerPoint I've ever done in my life. But 
in all seriousness, the, the fun is all within the software, and I want to get right to that. And I'll, I'm sure I'll jump in and interrupt Akil a little bit, as long as it's not too technical. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. kind of my goal on the show is we don't want to do death by PowerPoint, for sure. But we need to have some sort of you know background. We need to know a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. you're good. It's all good. Awesome. Cool. Simon, what do you think? How are you liking things? Excellent. I am very excited about the asset tracking. Kind of like you, I had a previous role where I was responsible for a 20 acre school campus and I had to track 10,000 assets on campus manually. And we had barcodes and a single handheld scanner. Oh God. The idea to be able to use RFID chips and like actually watch in real time as equipment and desks and things move between the classrooms, that would be a dream. So oh, that's cool. Simon, on that point, you know, the really exciting part that Akil will be showing is that we have the ability to, as you can see on this picture on there of, of zoning, areas and kind of geofencing areas so assets leave a certain area we can alert on it also if assets need to be serviced or calibrated or end of life out of the rotation we can we can provide alerts on that so there's so much more than just the ability to read the data but it's also facilitating the information to support you know better decision making yeah that's awesome awesome cool uh with that are we ready to move on to aquila i think okay. Yep. All right, cool. Let me go ahead and pull this. Ruben, Ruben says everything that I have to, I might as well just get into the demo. <laughs> cool. So right now, right now I have, uh, are you on the right window there? Uh, yep. All right. There we go. Okay, cool. Oh, all right. Let's see this. She was testing you, James. She was testing you. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, I can see behind the scenes for everyone. Uh, I can see what people have in their screen share, and I just saw an inception of our OBS system of showing each other. That's why I was like, are we on the right screen? Right, right. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think uh, just a little bit of background. So, um, you know, uh, when before we started the company, we, we were all working at, for Internet of Things um, at, you know, uh, a pretty big industrial company. Um, and I think what I've seen throughout my close to a decade working in IoT is that everybody is very excited by the idea of IoT, but then when it actually, like, and you know, you will find a lot of hobbies and people connecting things to Raspberry Pis and streaming data and all of that. Uh, but there's a huge gap in terms of when people want to work, have this work in the enterprise, right? Have this work in a production sort of environment at scale. Um, that, you know, everything was like a science project for the longest time and everybody talked about the potential of it, uh, but nobody, not a lot of people were realizing sort of the potential of Internet of Things in um, sort of industrial retail or like logistics settings. And, and that really is the mission and vision for us at Zimelgo is how do we build turnkey apps to help our manufacturers, to help our retailers and help our, you know, warehousing folks do their jobs more efficiently. and it, it's so good to hear like i think all pretty much every single one of us if you've done a ever done a high school job has had an experience uh, i think high school interns are the best to sort of do cycle counting you know so everybody just puts them um to to count stuff but um that's the reality even today right there is so many people out there who all their full-time job is basically counting inventory searching assets making sure nothing ends up on the floor, you know, trying to find where things are on the floor and things like that. So when we started building Zimalgo, we basically envisioned that as Google Maps for the factory, right? which would tell you in real time where anything is on the factory floor and allow you to make decisions on the basis of that. Um, so I'll, I'll start, um, like Ruben said, we built this up as four apps that you can uh, access through uh, a browser or uh, through a mobile app. Uh, and like James was saying, we sort of chose AWS as our platform of choice because we felt it offered us uh, the broadest range of services that we needed in order to like build this application and the scale um, that, that we were looking for. Uh, and so users typically can start with one app and then they can add additional apps to it. And what ends up happening is, I don't know if people have heard this concept of a digital thread, but if you really start to you know, track your raw material, then your raw material enters your manufacturing process. And that's when you go into the work orders application and then it enters sort of, you know, your finished goods inventory and then you know, ship it out. And so 
at the end of the day, Zimalgo, all the applications put together help you form a digital thread where you have cradle to grave visibility of any part at any point of time, which uh, eventually, you know, once this becomes mainstream, will have huge impacts to things like sustainability and, you know, lean and all of that. So anyways, with, with that sort of five minute overview, I'll get into inventory uh, tracking. And I would say this is probably the most time taking operation that happens on a factory floor. Uh, most people are manually counting things. Uh, I was just at an automotive uh, manufacturer and I was talking to them about their cycle counting and they said it takes them because there's so many items it takes them the whole year to cycle count and be ready for the next year. They sort of do it in phases and it pretty much takes them the entire year to go through all the items that they have so that they're ready. And so by the time they're ready for the next cycle count, their data is already a year old, right? And to try and make decisions based on um, data, which is never real time, you're either overstocking or understocking or you're paying expedite fees. So the cost of that is extremely high. And what we've tried to do with the Zimalgo inventory management software is make inventory tracking real time, right? Where each one of your items are tagged. Uh, we track them as they move through the entire operation. So you can actually see exact, exactly where this has been at, at what point of time. Oh, wow. And then we use that to then compute, right? So uh, another thing like Ruben was mentioning, you know, initially, a lot of people would just gather data, but they wouldn't know what this data meant, right? So now we can tell them, hey, this means that your item is now in stock. This means that your item is now out of stock. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the Amazon Go experience, but for a, a stock room on a factory floor or for a, a back stock room for a retailer, right? Um, but I can tell you in real time how much you have. You can get alerted if something goes below a stock. Um, you can actually start uh, with actually using um, Amazon um, sort of AI and machine learning services to predict because now we have real time consumption, we can actually do real time forecasting for customers also. Uh, and if you think of it in the past, there was never real time consumption data, right? So now I can tell you based on this, what's your average consumption before you run low on stock, I can actually start to forecast this out for you. And if you think about, you know, retail, um, you know, on average, I think retailers inventory is about 65% accurate in their stores. That's an industry average. Um, and so with RFID, you get to close to 98 to 99% accuracy. And again, that's through the ability to do inventories more frequently, because on average, they only take inventory in retail environments once a year, unless you're a high shrink store where you have a lot of theft and able to do it twice or possibly four times a year. But when you can do it daily or weekly, think about the information you're getting at and think about how you can support Omnichannel, Bopis, yeah. you know, buy online, pick up button store, make sure that our clients are truly informed about what they have to know what they need to re to replenish. So it's it's really key in those types of environments, manufacturing, retail, really any environment needing to understand their inventory positions. You, leveraging the sensor based technology really drives that home. That's, yeah. Yeah, it's really great for the end customer too. I know a lot of times I go to the big box stores. I'll check online mm -hmm. first. They have things that oh. show up, mm -hmm. and there's nothing there. Yeah, it's like exactly, exactly. That's the worst. Yeah, yeah, like I was trying to buy a barbecue when I first bought my house uh, back in the day, and online it said there was two left, and I literally had myself and like three other Home Depot employees going around. And we Such found it cool. eventually up in a corner, like up, you know how they have the rafters and stuff? Yeah. Like the, they were like two left up in the top like corner. Oh, but yeah. it took like a half an hour. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so James, because you brought that up, one of the features that gets used the most with our software is this Geiger counter like function, right? So with RFID, the beauty of it is you can just wave sort of this handle reader and it starts beeping as, as soon as you get close to something, right? So <laughs> That's so um, cool. We basically have, I would say, people like it's so funny when we go on site, like, you know, we basically just have people like wanting their entire facility, like trying to find things. But I mean, if you have been on these floors trying to do this, it's you know, it's so painful to do this, right? That They're the huge. Of inventory that's sitting there. Um, you can't even blame the Home Depot person. It's just there's so much yeah. sitting there. How are you going to find where it is? So with Zimalgo, like you have that breadcrumb trail which says where it was last seen. And then you use the Geiger counter and you wave it and you find it. Um, and we've had customers that went from, oh, I cannot find this thing for two weeks 
to now being able to find this in a couple of minutes. Like the amount of savings is is just gigantic. Um, and I think to add on to what Ruben was saying, I, the inventory tracking piece is so important. Like even for manufacturing, I, I was once with a, a pharmacy, a compounding pharmacy, and they have these gloves that they would keep running out of and nobody would tell them about it. But the thing is the glove by itself is not super expensive, but without a glove, the, you know, the pharmacy people cannot go into the lab. So now you basically have like a line down sort of situation, right? So um, that's, that's sort of the, the big uh, issue with not having accurate inventory. And, and we're trying to do that in like an extremely cost effective manner. I think a lot of people ask me, Hey, RFID has been around for a long time. Like why now? Like, why, why do you, why do you think it's taking traction now? And I basically tell them like, it's, it's a culmination of things, right? Like the fact that we have a service like AWS where, you know, it, it can handle the amount of IOT data that's being pumped into it. Uh, people are more open to having mobile phones on, you know, the factory floors where they are able to access that. And then RFID itself has become almost, you know, it's, it's 10 cents now. So it's, it's like putting a paper label on anything. So yeah. the cost of it is, is so that now people don't have to think twice about putting it on everything. Uh, versus, yeah, before it was, you know, something that they had to think about. And then, like I said, machine learning, right? Like, okay, I have all of this data. What am I going to do with it, right? And the fact that we now have machine learning models that can run and, and predict these things for people, it's a culmination of all of these things that have really made um, something like Zimalgo possible at this point of time. Awesome. Hey, can we break for, uh, we have a couple questions in chat. Maybe we can hit those real quick. Yeah. Uh, so first, let's talk about... Chowmeister or Chowmeister, super cool. I assume you can build alerts around different rules. Uh, is that something we're going to come to, or do you want to talk about it now? I'll just show it right now. Can you see awesome. it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. So I think another thing is we don't really want people staring at our screens, right? Like the reason we're doing this is so that we can eliminate all form of manual data entry, all form of manual reporting, um, and then just alert people of issues as they happen. So think of it as Zimelgo is their digital assistant on the floor, right? So if an item has gone missing, if there's an issue with a shipment where, you know, it was supposed like 50 shipped, but only 49 arrived, then you can go ahead and alert users. If a backlog is building up in a department, if, you know, stock is running low. So most people are basically just using our alerting system um, to alert them. So think of it as Zimelgo is their eyes and ears on the floor, which is constantly listening to everything that's happening. And then if there is an issue, then it's bubbling it up and, and letting the users know that there is an issue coming up. Awesome. And then uh, we have another question uh, regarding uh, device accuracy. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we kind of measure that? Like, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of answering that question. So uh, with with in terms of like being able to accurately locate uh, an item uh, where it is on the floor, uh, RFID it by itself in terms of accuracy has come a long way. So like Ruben said, now we're actually able to get to 99% accuracy, 98, 99% accuracy with these devices and the tags. Uh, and and it's, it's getting better each day. Like even six years ago when I started doing this, um, you know, we were tagging metal tools and stuff. And, you know, you could probably read them from a couple of feet away. And now you can read them from as much as 10 to 15 feet away, right? So I would say the accuracy... Um, has has gone up quite a bit. Um, having said that, we have internal um, mechanisms in place where we do everything from deduping to filtering um, to then sort of comparing that to what is the expected location, the expected drought, raising anomalies. Uh, also, we're learning um, as we go. So uh, we just don't take the data at face value. We actually learn from the data so that we can provide more and more uh, accurate information to our end user. And a lot of times we can run parallel initially to make sure that, you know, that there's a comfort level given. So think about inventory, you know, you take your traditional inventory, then you take it using RFID and you compare the two um, and giving you that that visibility and that comfort level that it's there. Even in manufacturing, as it goes from work cell to work cell and you're tracking that traveler moving through, um, you know, you compare that against your other data that you have, which is a lot less, but you still have something to compare it against to. And that gives them the comfort level of that. The system yeah. is working and also just yeah. i think this um the amount of deployments we've seen over the last uh you know so many years um the, the confidence level is so high and everybody is relying 
on this now as part of their their business practice. Yep. Yep. Awesome. And then uh, one more. Let's do one more before we uh, keep going here. Uh, I know that I think I know this is Bavier asks, can robots use these uh, so that uh, someone doesn't have to walk up and down using their Geiger counter? <laughs> wow. Um, if you are anywhere in Atlanta, uh, there is a conference happening, uh, which is called Modex. Uh, we're actually going to be demoing this with a robot. So you may want to come <laughs> check that out. <laughs> uh, but yes, so there is uh, there are robots which have RFID readers fitted on them. Uh, which are going to be used for cycle counting, for locating things in warehouses. Uh, a lot of warehousing, you know, the future of warehousing is is dark warehousing where you may not have people on the floor, but you still want, you know, cycle counts and all of those things to be happening on a regular basis. Um, and in that case, yeah, the whole software can one, work autonomously with, with a robot. Um, and yeah, like I said, we're demoing this at Modex. So yeah, if you're there in Atlanta, do, do check it out. Love yeah, I dropped the link. Yeah. Yeah, I dropped the link in the chat. Uh, it's also across the screen, but also if you just want to click on it, go ahead and click on that in the in the chat there. Uh, with that, let me take just, I promise this will be it. Let me take two seconds to say, if you're just tuning in, please welcome to Howdy Partner. We are an AWS show where we highlight partner solutions. My name is James Spencer. I'm a partner solutions architect. We're here every Wednesday at two o'clock. If you're interested about learning about different partner solutions, how they can help your business, how they can help your Maybe your personal life. I don't know. Uh, come on and tune in. Today, we're talking to Zamelgo. We're talking IoT, RFID technology, and their solution for inventory management, asset tracking, all those sorts of things. So if you have any questions, any comments, please drop them in the chat, and we'll try to get to them. Awesome. With that, I will stop talking <laughs> and taking away. But cool. Yeah, so... I, I can and again I think those questions were great so I'm I'm happy to do more of the questions than than the demo um, but yeah, sure. the, Simon mentioned the uh, the asset tracking use case and this is one that I just talked to a customer right before this um, a, a really uh, big uh, chip manufacturer and they were mentioning hey we have you know, 10,000 tools all across everything is, and you would think, you know, hey, you know, big companies, sophisticated, they have something in place. It's all being tracked on Excel. And it's not uncommon, you know, just because there isn't enough cost-effective tools in the market to do this. Most people are tracking their tools on Excel. Um, and to add to it, you know, they're tracking calibration dates and everything on Excel. Um, and they literally have one person whose responsibility is to run out onto the floor, Try to find what is expired, bring it out. Particularly in aerospace and DoD, if you're if you're caught with uh, a tool which is expired on the floor, like the fines could be really hefty, and you could be pretty much end up losing contracts uh, as a result of that. Um, I remember one customer I talked to early on. He said, "You know what, Akela? I from a process perspective, we have taken this as far as we can. Like we need technology to save us now." Because no matter what we do from a process perspective, there's always a miss. Uh, and that's really where the asset tracking solution came out of, where we allow users to track tools. You know, we'll alert them when, when calibration is coming due or if, you know, if the tool has actually expired calibration. We'll tell them where it is sitting on the floor. Um, you can look at the history of it at any point of time. When did it enter? When did it leave? Um, and if it's found somewhere, you know, it actually will send an alert back saying, hey, you know, it was found at this particular location, even though it was not supposed to be here. Um, and again, this is where, you know, the Geiger counter, um, I have a customer, she used to spend her entire Friday just looking for expired tools on the floor. And now she basically spends 30 minutes and she just has like an entire Friday back to her uh, to do additional work because she's now able to like track these things down. Um, really, really easily. Well, and a lot of times too, Akila, with that is, you know, it's not sometimes where is it in the building? It's, I know the general area where it is, but I'm not sure all these tools look alike. I'm not sure which one it needed to be calibrated for me to be staying compliance. So yeah. be able to use that, that search and find feature, feature and get right to the appropriate tool. Uh, that's, that was, that was key for that, that one specific client. The yeah, I don't job. know if people have, you have worked in manufacturing, but usually like on the caliper, there'll be like a tiny little tag which says when it's supposed to expire. I mean, you basically need a, like a, a microscope, like to be able to read that sort of stuff. Uh, it's, it's just super hard. And then everything looks exactly the same. 
The other thing, I think, good to mention out here, uh, you see the red, you'll see the green and the yellow coloring. I just think it's important to point out because we're about ease of use. Um, and by, you know, if you go back to the assets, Akilah, and you see the kind yeah. of the, the boxes around the assets, it just shows, you know, red is something that needs to be addressed right now. Something is overdue. You know, yellow is something that's coming due soon. It could be calibration, could be servicing, could be end of life. And then green, it's in good standing. And if you go to the zones, when you break up the zones, you'll see we, we do the same theming through the zones. So everything is about simplicity here, making it really easy um, for um, people to identify when something needs to be addressed and where. And that, that was part of the reasoning behind the coloring scheme. Yep. So you, you mentioned the ease of use. We're wondering what, what's the end customer's training like to actually start onboarding with this? Yeah, I mean, I think we're pretty proud of the fact that we we don't actually have to do a lot of training. You know, people, we just go on site. Um, the way our IoT devices are set up, they, they're like Alexa, right? You just go in, you plug in to the network. They start directly talking to our AWS cloud instance, to our AWS IoT core endpoint. So there's literally like zero on-site setup that needs to be done other than like installing, you know, um, the RFID readers. The users download the app on their phone, and as soon as the ta tag starts getting detected at these locations, they can pretty much start seeing that information, um, you know, on on the phone or on their app itself. Uh, so, and we and we work with we work with partners to support our clients from uh, deploying the the RFID reader, so they don't need to know how to do that. Uh, we have experts go on site; they do that deployment, um, and they help the clients along the line. Nice. Yeah, I'm assuming they, those partners also help actually determine the logical of where we need to actually have devices, yeah. where we should be segmenting the rooms, that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, we do a yeah. we do a site assessment. We determine what those zones should be, you know, where their needs are, and then yeah, and that that information then turns into a proposal of where the type of equipment that's needed to support those zones, and then we can do the deployment. Thanks. How exactly. specific can you be with those zones with the actual geofencing? Can it be by room or by specific workstation? What's the uh, it yeah, you can go down to specific workstations. So we have customers oh. that are basically saying, "Hey, you know, I'm, I have like four tables, and I want to know like it it went from table one to table two to table three to table four because I have different processes happening on it." Um, and the beauty of uh, this technology is, you know, you can you can tune it to the point where I'm just picking stuff within, uh, you know, two foot by two foot area or one foot by one foot area, all the way till I want to be able to pick up everything in this room, right? So there are ceiling readers which will basically tell you X, Y locationing of everything in the room. Thanks. Yeah, those are great questions. It's almost like you've done this before, Simon. <laughs> I mean, this just sounds so much better than what I did. So I'm very- <laughs> Yeah, <interested>. right? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, since you were talking about, you know, work in progress is another solution, which is very, very popular. Um, and if, you know, the reason this is really picked up over the last couple of years is if you think of it, um, the way, you know, work is being tracked in, in, in most facilities today is I barcode scan saying I'm starting and then I barcode scan saying I'm stopping and I have to do that for every single job that I do. And a lot of times people forget or they don't do it or they backflash the system. So anybody who's trying to get accurate data on how long it takes for them to do something, where exactly a part is, is it, you know, you only know about where something is when something's being actively worked on. If it's sitting in staging, you know, if it's done and sitting in to be waiting to be picked up, you have absolutely zero idea where it is, right? Um, but, and then it's also like a additional overhead. Like you would rather have your people just making things. That's what they're good at. But now they've become data entry operators and they're also making things, right? So our goal has been, how can we eliminate this sort of manual data entry and still capture the data that's needed? Um, we work with a really big boats manufacturer and he said, listen, my people are already too busy trying to get the number of boats out that we need to. And I just can't burden them with like additional data entry, but I still want to know where my boat is. Is it getting done on time or not? And this is sort of the perfect solution for them, right? So we'll, we'll track where everything is on the floor. You know, it'll tell you if you're starting to run into issues. So Simon, this is to your question. We are tracking at a workstation level. And then if there's a workstation which is running behind and it's not meeting its schedule, then you sort of know that it's running behind. You see what order it is. Uh, when was it last seen on that? You know, how many pro steps in the process has it finished? And then you can go ahead and, and do that. Um, I mean, people use this all sorts of different ways. Even we are learning like a lot of times, uh, you know, a customer will call in and say, I want to get something expedited, right? Then I can go ahead and look for 
a part and then I can see where exactly it is on the floor. It'll tell me, hey, it's exactly at this particular location. Then I can see, oh, is it close to getting done? I'll go ahead and expedite it at that point of time. So I can expedite it and it sends out an alert letting everybody know that I, I want this done sooner. But the beauty of it is all of this is happening in real time. Like in the past, you would not know till about a week or a day later, you know, that you're running behind or where exactly something is. And so your decision making was also delayed too. I, I remember most manufacturers I talk to, they'll say, oh, we always buffer our delivery dates by, you know, a couple of weeks. But they're like, oh, now with Amazon telling you your box is seven steps away, our customers require us to do the same. But we just don't have a way of doing it. <laughs> that totally reminds me of a Star Trek quote that Scotty used to do. He, Kirk always asked, he asked him, do you always buffer your, your time expectations by a factor of four? He's yeah. like, of course. Otherwise, how do I look like a miracle worker? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then, I mean, this is again where, you know, the machine learning really comes into play because now I can really start to come up with patterns on you know, how often things are getting delayed, how long they're spending, uh, how long are they spending at a particular location because I have that real-time data, right? And then I can start to raise anomalies uh, in real time and, and alert users of that. So we've, we've talked like inventory and asset tracking. And I, I mean, this should have been obvious to me, but like, for example, like you mentioned, if something is going to take time to build, like you can actually see those different steps. And like you said, if it's like, yes. oh, we need to make it go or we need to tag this one as being like higher priority, you can hopefully push it through that assembly or mm -hmm. line or workflow faster. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I think once you empower people with real time data, like even we yeah. are surprised at how people are really using that data. Right. Um, I mean, I always say it's like, you know, when, before we had Google Maps, we had paper maps. I mean, you sort of knew how you were supposed to go to a place, but you couldn't say, oh, I want to change my route, right? Because I don't know, yeah. like there was an accident or something in between. But now with the map, it's telling you, hey, change your route, go this way, or, you know, use an alternate route. Um, and imagine being able to do that for, for our manufacturing or our logistics processes, right? It's just, uh, you can really change the game there once you empower these people with sort of these insights in real time. That's cool. Um, I had another thought, though, actually. Uh, a lot of businesses, like, say they've been around for 30 years and they're, like, really entrenched in their technologies or workflows. What does it look like to maybe integrate Zomelgo into that? Is there, I mean, I'm sure they don't have to just scrap everything and start yeah. Yeah. fresh. Like, what does that kind of look like? Do you guys do, like, an assessment? Do you work with them? Is it out of the box, just plug and play? How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, the way we actually designed them, I'll go from ground up was we've designed it to be an embrace and extend system because we were like, hey, nobody's going to replace their ERP or their MES or their SCADA systems or anything like that. Right. So we designed it to be an embrace and extend system like they can use it completely standalone, like Ruben was saying in the beginning. Um, and, and I said, in most cases, you know, we can have the system up and running in less than a day where they can start using it. But then we can be completely behind the scenes where they're just using our APIs. Um, to then pull data and integrate into their systems, which is where we use API Gateway and AppSync um, so that they can actually access you know, our GraphQL APIs and import all of this data into their system. So everything is completely you know, programmatic where they, they can take this data and completely put that in their systems. So in a way, it's like eliminating all the manual data entry that they're doing and then programmatic putting this data, programmatically putting this data into their systems. Um, okay. So it's, it's actually... Um, pretty very easy i mean most most of our standard integrations just take us maybe two weeks at the max like it's it, yeah it's nothing crazy nice yeah that's not bad at all yeah <clears throat> i mean the first week is just to get the credentials in the sandbox and then the next week is here's our apis and you know here's how you integrate cool yeah this is great shipment dashboard yeah, and so I think the final use case is okay. I've built my thing, but you know, I now need to be able to track it as it leaves my facility or arrives at my customer's facility, or leaves my facility and goes to a partner's facility who's going to do the remaining part of the process. Um, yeah, we we have this running at a couple of logistics companies that are you know providing uh, inventory to their customers, right? So knowing in their case they have an SLA where um, they are asked to deliver items in less than two hours. 
And until now, they, they really did not have a good way of tracking if they were meeting their SLA. So in a lot of cases, or they did not even know that, you know, okay, I meet the SLA, but the item is sitting there, the end customer has not even picked it up. And so now it's, you know, with Zamelco, they know exactly when the item left their dog doors, exactly when it arrived. They also know that, hey, I mean, I shipped 19, but it looks like I've only received, you know, nine, or I've only received nine items or 10 items in that facility, right? So it's basically giving them that visibility list saying not everything got received, maybe, you know, got dropped off at the wrong location, maybe it's still sitting in the truck. So all of that gets, they get that information, you know, right away uh, with, with the system. Yeah, whether it's internally shipping from manufacturing to distribution or it's shipping from, you know, distribution to uh, to a client, we can validate that it left the facility. And sometimes there's relationships between the clients and their customers and they, they can read it at the receiving side as well. We have Dr. Dave. Yes, he's asking, what do employees do with all that extra time you're saving? I said, get more AWS certs. <laughs> that looked great. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. great. Yeah, so, I mean, I think if you think of it, there's so much labor shortage going on right now that, you know, companies can, any amount of time that they can save themselves um, is, is a huge win for them. I mean, yeah, it just hiring people in the current market is, is crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure. So we, we can install some Melgo no matter what our size, right? We could be a startup. We could be mm -hmm. enterprise. We yes. could be super global enterprise. We could be world domination enterprise. Yep. Like, yeah. We, we start with single reader deployments uh, to enterprise grade with, you know, uh, you know, 500 plus readers. So it really doesn't, there's no lim limit, um, but it, there's an easy entry point. And which allows companies again that are not may not be as quite comfortable or as familiar with the technology that could ease their way into it and do that crawl walk run approach but we do have you know our pricing also supports that we have entry level per reader is where we charge uh, the monthly SaaS, but we also have site licenses and we have enterprise or campus licenses so we have different ways uh, depending on the client that's looking for the solution yeah, and usually people start with one app and, you know, once they have the infrastructure in place, they're like, oh, you know, now I may want to track my tools too. And now I want to track my work orders too. And it's the, the same exact hardware which can provide them visibility into, you know, different aspects of, of their workflow. So they, they get a lot out of um, their initial CapEx investment. Yeah. Um, let me just jump in and say it wouldn't be an AWS show without surveys. We have two of them, one for Howdy Partner and one for Zamelgo. Uh, we have, I'll drop both of those in the chat right now, but I just did drop the Zamelgo one. Uh, if you'd like to get more information from Ruben or Akila or anyone else on the Zamelgo team, uh, go ahead and fill out that form and they can get back to you, get you the right people to talk to. Uh, and then I've pinned up at the top of the chat our Howdy Partner survey. Uh, tell us what you liked on the show, what you want to see more of, how much you loved everyone that was presenting today. Um, fill out both if you can. Fill out some algo, obviously, if you can't fill out both. And uh, please take, the, they're quick, they take 30 seconds. Uh, please check those out, and then they will get back to you and help you fill out all your needs as far as all of their solutions. Inventory management, asset tracking, shipments, work orders, all that good stuff. Cool. Uh, Simon, what do you think? Any thoughts? Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what's the most basic level to get started? The customer's interested. They want to, like, just get their toes wet. Where should they start? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. They could. I mean, it depends initially on the in what type of client it is. Is it manufacturing? Is it retail? You know, it, but you can start with a single reader. And a lot of times you start with a, a handheld, right, Akila? I mean, generally, somebody will yeah. start with a mobile device. Um, and, uh, and they can use that to scan items and we can provide tags uh, and um, they can apply them, take inventory, or they can track it through their work order process, or they can um, you know, use it to track some assets and to track when something needs to be serviced or calibrated. So you can start with as little as one RFID sensor, one, one reader, uh, and you can grow from there. And uh, you know, we had one company that deployed three readers 
Uh, and then shortly thereafter, they had over 120 readers deployed in that single facility. And that went so well, they did it in the second facility. It's an aerospace parts manufacturer. Um, and it's they use it for asset tracking, work order management, um, as well as shipment tracking. And they have that many, it went from three to 120 plus readers. So that gives you an idea of the type of scale and how quickly that moves. Uh, and, and and obviously the ROI was there for them. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big win all around. Nice. And maybe I missed this before, but as far as actual hardware, do you provide the hardware directly or through partners or do the customers yep. bring their own hardware? What's the best method? Yeah, great, great question. So we're we are 100% partner focused. So we look for organizations that are familiar with the technology that have deployed the technology before. We have relationships with many companies today. So if somebody has a partner that they like to use, they can and we can work with them. Uh, or if they uh, are looking for somebody and some support, we'll bring in one of our uh, partners that understands the technology and can and can help them with uh, assessing what's needed, whether it's a handheld, whether it's a um, a fixed reader, um, and then uh, and then also we would deploy the software in conjunction with them. So uh, we, absolutely, we would do it through partners, and that's what we would suggest and recommend. Thanks. And Kill, awesome. it's worth just pointing out real quick on the bottom right hand corner is our a little support button. That yep. thing, I, I love that because anywhere with a mobile device within a desktop within a tablet, you can click on that button and type a question, our engineering team will respond. So it's uh, it's great to have, and it probably uh, takes the majority of our, our initial support tickets. So we, we, again, we're, we're about making things easy and, and quick to understand. So that's why we have it there. Will that support like, tell me that I'm doing well in life and uh, give me my- uh... Soon, Soon. Yeah. we're working on that. We're working on it. So so tell your it's, it's funny, like one time there was a customer who, who sent out a, a IT request to us, which was just for like their internal IT, but, uh, and then one of our guys got back and he's like, oh, this question was not even meant for you, but like, I do appreciate the response. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Uh, awesome. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to show us today? Anything? Yeah, I think that, on? and then, um, I mean, the whole system is built to be searchable, right? So as as people, you know, start adding a bunch of assets to their system, you know, it, it'll actually start to tell them where anything is at at any point of time. So it's supposed to give them that sort of Google Maps-like visibility, like Google search-like visibility, where it'll tell you everything that's happened with it and then allow you to like quickly find the system. So yeah, the goal has been, how do I allow people to find things quickly? And then how do I alert them of issues as they happen and, and do that in a way where nobody has to enter any piece of information? It looks like our team got back here. Anyways. <laughs> it looks like there's another question in the chat, I think, James. Yeah. Right? yeah, we got one more coming in. Let's see, what do we got? What services from YYZ, love the Rush reference, uh, what services do you use from AWS IoT and your solutions? Anything you enjoy or hope to improve building some Melga using AWS IoT. Yeah, so we actually use um, the IoT SDK. Um, that's what we use at, for our edge application to con translate, um, you know, since we integrate with a wide range of readers um, and, you know, most of them don't support MQTT. So we take that data, we do a bunch of filtering, we translate it into JSON, you know, use the AWS IoT SDK to send that data over uh, to the AWS IoT endpoint. So we use um, IoT Core um, to receive that. And then we basically have, you know, per device rules that are set up um, so that we can figure out how to like translate data from each one of those. So, yeah, so we use sort of both ends, the, the listening and the sending end of, of AWS IoT. And then from there, um, the data actually ends up in time stream. Uh, we process the data in time stream and then it goes on to Neptune and Dynamo and so on and so forth. Yeah. I have to learn about time stream myself. That's one I haven't really touched. So I actually, after this, I'm going to take a 15 minutes and actually kind of take a look at that. Yeah. I mean, I think for us, it's been pretty beneficial for sort of the raw data. Uh, and then, you know, since the raw data doesn't really need to live for a long time, uh, but we need sort of a faster ingest on the raw data that then we can process um, and then go ahead and, you know, uh, then we sort of make the data richer with all the metadata saying, hey, this tag number means this particular um, item, like this is a blue paint can, which is getting detected at this. And so all when all the metadata comes together, then we put it in Neptune. And like I said, we really chose Neptune because we wanted to build out that digital thread. 
So we wanted to know this item, you know, uh, was part of this particular work order, which got shipped on this particular day uh, to this particular customer. So that when, then when we build advanced analytics, we're able to allow users um, to, to query um, sort of all of these relationships that are built on the fly uh, and then get that um, real-time view of, of what's happening. So that's really what we use Neptune for. Okay. And then you spoke about analytics. I was actually going to mention this. I see export as CSV over there. Mm -hmm. um, so everything, essentially, you know, it all comes down to data. To, to steal my one of my friend's sayings, data is the new oil. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to, if we can export that and say we had our own analytics, you know, yes. solutions, maybe like QuickSight or I don't know, mm -hmm. um, something else. I, my brain's farting it's yeah. right now. But we can ingest that and do our own analytics. Say we have our own BI tools uh, with that information. I'm assuming it looks like. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's exactly what this is meant for. So yeah, people use this all the time to just get the data out of their system, run their own analysis. And then um, I think um, Simon was mentioning we use S3 too. And so in S3, you know, we'll, we'll sort of put all the historical reports. So if users want to be able to access the historical reports, then, you know, we provide them access um, through our interface, not directly to S3, but through our interface, but the data is all stored on, uh, on S3. Okay. Cool. And then I have to say, as I've been, is caustic soda a thing? Because every in my mind, I keep reading caustic soda, and I'm thinking of a can of soda where it's like, oh, this will be refreshing, and it just melts my face. Uh, no, it yeah, it is. It is a thing which is you know, it's used in the manufacturing process. So yeah, don't that's another it. one I'm gonna look up. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a can of soda. Yeah. <laughs> along I was, I had, maybe I'll yeah. find something else for you here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Along the yeah, lines of that caustic soda, I was reading yesterday that you can deploy this in harsh environments. Do you have any examples of where it's been deployed? Oh. Yes, yeah. So we have customers that put these, um, you know, items through ovens, you know, because their parts need to go through ovens. Uh, we have this deployed in, you know, uh, we're right now actually deploying it in a company that does lung transplants in a lot of their operating theaters. Uh, we've it deployed at um, pharmaceutical companies, um, cryogenic stuff. Uh, so yeah, a lo lot of different kinds of harsh environments. And particularly, I mean, I think, which is why a lot of people initially did not venture into manufacturing just because of the requirements that were there. I mean, you see a lot of this in retail, but um, yeah, I mean, in manufacturing in general, there's, there's a lot of metal, there is, you know, liquids, there is uh, coolants, there's all of that stuff. Um, and and you know, we, we run into that all day long. Nice. So when I do my uh, Antarctic research, I can go. Uh, I can go down and deploy them. I'll go down in Antarctica. You can actually, yeah. As long as the, there's an AWS instance that supports. It. Oh, that's true. That might be. That might make it a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I we we've had people requesting, you know, um, using these at like minus forty degree free freezers and things like that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this seems like uh, we have another partner that does. Uh, something kind of the same, but they deal specifically with like food expiration mm -hmm. and food freshness. This mm -hmm. seems like it would be a really cool kind of tandem right. thing to work with them. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I don't have any. I can't think of anything else to say. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to show us today, or? I think that's, start? Yeah. No, I think that's a good overview. I don't want to, like you said, bore people with. A, a long running demo. Oh no, it's all good. Like the demo is the fun part. Like yeah. that's the part that this is. This is when we get to click around and see what it actually looks like. Is like yeah. this is this is what we live for here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Uh, is there any more? If there's any more questions or comments from the chat, yeah, keep them coming in. We're trying to hit them all. I think we got to most of them. Um, with that, let's go ahead and we can talk about. What what's on the roadmap for Zamelgo? Like we mentioned, some of the uh, mm -hmm. the shows and conferences you're going to be part of, maybe our future future launches that we can talk about, or on the road. You know, like I said, the roadmap. Anything yeah, like, that? like I said, uh, for us, there's there's a huge uh, emphasis on, on machine learning. We're actually looking at using AWS Q uh, 
uh, for sort of building out a chat GPT like interface. Uh, again, it's it's how do we get this data out to the user like really, really easily, right? And then uh, for inventory handlers, for example, they want to know what's my dead inventory? Why has it not moved in a really long time? Um, or they want to know like what items are getting consumed the fastest, right? So uh, we're, we're looking at how, what else can we do to get this data in the hands of the factory floor operator, right? So uh, make it easy for them to be able to access the data. Uh, the other things that we're looking at are, is a lot of different sensors, you know, so today, like we said, we primarily use RFID. Uh, we're looking at active sensors. We're looking at computer vision, uh, particularly for tracking time at a workstation, you know, using combination of these sensors um, to then be able to pull data off of that uh, and provide like sort of more accurate uh, visibility into what's happening on the floor. So I'd say those are sort of the two big areas of investment for us. Of course, I mean, we, we continue to work towards, you know, um, building out a massively scaled out system where people could have millions of items, you know, they could all be distributed across the world, tracking them in real time. Um, I always give my team this example, right? With a, a traditional sort of ERP warehousing system, people pull a report uh, and, you know, it can take eight hours to run and that's sort of expected. Uh, but in our case, you know, they're all expecting real-time data, right? They want It doesn't matter if it's a million items or 10 million items. They want to know in real time, you know, if something is going below a certain threshold. So that's that's definitely an area that, you know, that we continue to sort of innovate and expand in. Yeah. The, uh, machine learning, do you envision this as an extension of the existing products or a new standalone product that would be complementary? Yeah. It's actually going to be an extension. So like I was saying, you know, even with, you know, when I'm tracking work orders, I want to be able to tell users, hey, you know, this is sort of deviating from your existing, um, the amount of time that it takes at the station, like it's taking more than what it generally takes. So it's going to be very closely built in uh, into the product and then, um, you know, allowing people to, our, our search is basically going to become a, a chat GPT like interface that they can then start to ask questions off of. So it's, it's going to be very deeply integrated into the product to make it a, a lot more richer and useful to the user. Makes sense. Yeah. Once the customer has that infrastructure in place, generating yeah. this extra value from it, it's really useful. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then we mentioned that you're going to be at Modex in Atlanta. When is Modex again? March, I think it is? Modex is in early March. Uh, NRF is actually this upcoming weekend, starting on Sunday, going through Wednesday. That's in New York City. Um, that's a retail show, obviously, NRF retail. And then, yeah, Modex is more manufacturing logistics. Um, so we're really excited about those are two big conferences that we'll be at. We're doing a lot of SKOs, you know, kickoffs with our partners. We're supporting our partners and going and presenting and meeting with them. And, you know, if anybody has interest in, in learning more, we'd love to uh, absolutely have you reach out and we can do a, a personalized uh, presentation and, and demo of the software and, and, and more details to make sure we're answering any specific questions you might have. Yeah, cool. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to make it on Sunday, but maybe uh, <laughs> I don't maybe in March. I don't have a choice, James. I'm, I'm going no matter what, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And then uh, maybe we can talk about uh, the AWS partnership real quick. Um, a little birdie on my to shoulder told me to share the uh, microsites that we have <laughs> and specifically mention about the case studies and solution brief. I dropped the link to the microsite in the chat. I'm going to throw up the banner in a second. Um, so as a, as an AWS partner, what have, what have you seen from the partnership? What has that been kind of like? I mean, I'll, I'll touch on it first from a, 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 you know, sales perspective and Akil can touch on the technical side, but I mean, we've got a lot of exposure uh, to a lot of different departments within, within AWS, which has been tremendous, you know, different vertical leaders, uh, leads. I'm actually meeting with, with a few people at, at NRF, I'll be meeting with more people at Modex, and um, we really appreciate the engagement um, that they've, uh, you know, really embraced us as a as a as a partner, and uh, we're taking full advantage of that, and and you know, making sure that the di different uh, groups and verticals are are aware of who we are, what we're doing, and how we can support their clients and provide them a valuable solution. Yeah, and if you check out that the microsite that I linked, uh, there's a one pager that was written by both members of Zamelgo and AWS. Uh, definitely check that out. That, that should, yeah. uh, that should be a little, that should be interesting to see what that kind of is like from the people that actually wrote it. So yep. that'll be cool. 
Awesome. Um, before we check out, is there any last things we want to talk about before we uh, before we sign off here? You can say no, it's okay. <laughs> well, I, just, I, I just want to give a big thank you, uh, you know, to both you, you know, James, yes. yourself, and Simon for inviting us to this event. We love having the opportunity to talk about some Elgo and and we're really proud of what we're doing, you know, and, and what we're delivering. So we love to have more conversations, we like to speak to as many people as possible. And we feel like again, we have an impact we're impacting businesses globally and we want to continue doing that. Yeah, great. Yes. Um, and then I, I mean, we truly value AWS. That's the core of everything that we do. So being yeah. able to do this with AWS, I think, is is really great. Yeah. Uh, I love doing the show with people. Like I mentioned, I like seeing I, we deal with me and Simon. We deal with a lot of partners uh, solutions as far as like tech, technical validation type stuff. So we see a lot of white papers. We see a lot of diagrams. We don't get to see very often the the things the solutions in action and that's one of the things that personally and legitimately it's not lip service i i love doing this to actually get to see all the stuff like oh that's what i was looking at the last three months <laughs> like yeah. uh cool and if there's anything do you guys is, does anyone have like are you instagram famous uh akula are you a TikToker? Like, oh, I wish, I wish. Yeah, I'm Instagram famous for the four people in my house. <laughs> hey, that's what matters. As long as it's with the people that matter. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I actually just recently deleted the Instagram app on my phone and my daughter was very upset. She's like, how can you delete the Instagram app on your phone? <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, I pretty much play on LinkedIn. So you, you put that up there earlier and I appreciate that. And definitely please anybody out there reach out to me and LinkedIn love to love to connect and have a conversation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Simon, any last things from you? I'm going to go ahead and, well, I shouldn't have said that. Let me go ahead and drop the AWS or the How You Partner survey once more. And there's a Melgo web form. If you'd like to let us know how we did on How You Partner. And if you'd like to connect with some Melgo, go ahead and fill out those. And with that, I'll say, Simon, is there anything you'd like to, to, end, uh, to leave us with? Just thank both of you as well. This has been a really exciting event. And like, like I said before, your solution is the dream I had 10 years ago. So I wish we had the ability to actually put that in place. Yes. I'm, I'm awesome. glad we are. Yeah, I, I, I hear that so many times. I, I just was in a call today and the, uh, the, uh, we asked the customer, we said, so how quickly do you want to move? And he said, I wanted to do this five years ago. So do you need an answer? And I said, no, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. Uh, well, please tune in. Please tune in next week. Uh, we'll be having product board. So uh, product ma project management is always fun. Perhaps you use Jira. Perhaps you use those things. Product board, another different kind of solution. They have, they'll have different things for you. So please in tune in next week. Same same time, same channel. Two o'clock on Wednesday, and we'll bring you some product board. And with that, from everyone here, Audi Partner and Zamelgo, thank you all for coming, and we will see you next time. Thank All you. right. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.